seems like wherever I want to go in Delaware, I have to go through Middletown. I, I'm through Middletown constantly, and I dread it every time I do it because every time I go, there's one less farm and one new housing development. Everywhere you look, yesterday there was a farm, and today there's 500 new houses. I, I, one wonders where all these people work. And if that weren't worry enough, you look at the signs out front that say, new single-family homes from the low 500s, new townhomes from the mid-300s. I'm thinking, who can afford to live in America anymore? I, I read something this week that speculated there will soon be 100-year mortgages. Yeah, think about that for a minute. There's a whole sermon in that, in the fact that we've somehow managed to price ourselves out of being able to live in a house in our own country, and I'll talk about that someday perhaps, but today I'm more interested in the use of the word home in all of those cases. Uh, you will know perhaps that the, the real estate development industry has appropriated that word home and uses it for its full value, which is pretty emotional among other things. They talk about themselves as being home builders. They talk about somebody as being in a starter home. You, you, you're meant to have the, the, idea, the ideal of home ownership is what we're all supposed to be aiming for. In some cases, among the ones who are more cynical, they'll even talk about used homes. Have you seen this? The idea that if you are not the first owner of that house, you are living in a used home, which is somehow second best, I guess, like used anything else. When I see that, I think of those people who live in 18th century stone farmhouses in, in Chester County, how disappointed they must be that they don't live in something made of styrofoam last week. Home, home, home. It, it, it has a lot of emotional baggage. And yet I think you and I know that in reality, it begins with a house. It begins with a building. It's only what goes on inside that building that may create a home or a dwelling, or a residence, or anything else we might use to describe the life that happens inside that outer shell, that, that box. So it's worth thinking sometimes about what is the shell and what is the stuff inside, what is the house, and what is the home. There's a lot of talk about houses in the lessons this morning, and particularly in the gospel. I want to unpack that a little bit. Before I get too far into that, I want to remind you of something that I talked about in a sermon back in February, early in Lent. I was talking about how whenever we tell a story, there are multiple stories in it. There's my story, there's our story, and there's God's story. And I think it's helpful when we hear these stories told in the gospel this morning and elsewhere in the lessons to think about what part of that is my story and how is that speaking about my story, how is it speaking about our story, and how is it speaking about God's story with humanity. So, we begin at the beginning of the gospel, and right off the bat, I have to say, they did something weird when they put this lesson together. Whoever framed the lessons for the week, they left out the beginning of the first sentence. We jump right into the middle of a sentence, into the middle of the story, and they couldn't even eat. All these people, okay, fine, but why were they trying to? The beginning of the first sentence that they left out was, Jesus went, and then there's another word. In the version of the gospel that we read, the translation, the New Revised Standard Version that we read here on Sundays, it says, Jesus went home. There's that word again. But that's not what it says in Greek. In the original, the person who wrote it, who wrote it down first, said Jesus went into a house. So right off the bat, at the beginning of the story, Jesus is in the house. I didn't use that expression at 8 o'clock because I knew I would get only blank stares. Now I'm getting blank stares too. Oh well, so much for my attempts. Thank you very much. <laughs> From the very beginning, Jesus has gone in and is making some sort of home in this place. Jesus, who has no home, who says elsewhere he has no place to lay his head, wherever he goes, with whoever he goes with, home goes with him, has gone into this house and is now creating some sort of life there. <clears throat> this ought to make us think right away about who's inside and who's outside. We know who went in with Jesus, because we know who, who was eating dinner with only a week ago. 
It was tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners and other unsuitable people. We have to assume they followed him from that dinner to this story and they've gone into the house with him. Now we know who's inside. It seems like all the opposition is outside. All those who want to try to shut Jesus down, all those who want to shut Jesus up are coming to this house from somewhere else. So now we know who's inside and who's outside. And it's easy. Someone after 8 o'clock this morning was saying how helpful it is to remember this isn't just a story that happened then, it's a story that happens now. God was then, God will be, and God is. That's where we should get just a little nervous because now we're in the house. We should be asking ourselves who's in this house and who's out there. Note in this story that it sounds like the front door is wide open. It sounds like just anybody can walk in who wants to because Jesus is so busy he can't even get down to what he was there for, which was to rest maybe. Contrast that with what we hear later in the gospel after Jesus has been crucified and his followers are meeting. They're locked in a room for fear of those who otherwise would persecute them. In this case, there, is, there are no barriers. There's, there's nothing stopping anybody who wants to walk in and be near Jesus to do so. <clears throat> How does that line up with us sitting in this house? Are there barriers that keep people from walking in here? Are there barriers that keep people walk, from walking into, not, not specifically this building even, but what we are doing as the kingdom of God, as the followers of Jesus? What is it that stops people, perhaps, from coming in here? If you want to be even a little more nervous about it, what are the doors that block up your heart? What are the barriers that keep those whom Jesus loves, those whom Jesus values, all that God desires from entering into your heart and my heart? And how many protective walls have we put up to keep those people and those needs out. So, from the very beginning, there's a house, there's something going on. How does that line up with you and with me and with us? Then the opposition begins. First, they're going to try to say that he's possessed by a demon. This is exactly what we do nowadays, dear friends, when we say that so-and-so is, fill in the blank, a communist, a fascist, a racist, MAGA, Antifa, whatever name you want to stick in there at the end of that sentence, it's a way of defining someone and meaning we don't have to pay any more attention to that person. They are in this category, and we know what that category is, so now we don't have to worry about them anymore. Kids do this on the playground all the time. You like, feel like you're losing an argument? You call the, kid, the other kid a name. Now the other kid has to stop whatever the argument was and defend against whatever that name is. <clears throat> I suspect that's what those who came from Jerusalem were thinking Jesus was going to do. Oh yeah, you think I'm possessed by a demon? Well, no, I'm not. What makes you think that? You can imagine how sputtering and useless that argument would be. And I think Jesus figured that out. But he doesn't come back with that. He doesn't come back with, no, I'm not. Instead, he throws back at them the illogic of their argument and brings yet another house into the picture in the process. He's talking now about a house, not in the sense of a literal building, but in the sense of a, a collection of people, a movement, a, 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 an organization, Think of the, the House of Habsburg, or the House of Windsor, the House of Chanel, but also the House of David and the House of Israel. We are in the house of Jesus for that purpose, are we not? How does a house hang together when it's a group of people, when it's a group of ideas, when it's a mission instead of a literal building? We can think about how literal buildings are held together. I will confess part of my ignorance with respect to architecture. I have lived on the East Coast on and off for most of my life, and I've always gone past all of those 18th century houses and buildings you'll see that have the stars on the side. 
You ever seen that? A metal star? And I always figured it was just decoration. You know, it's a whole building. They're being patriotic. No. It turns out those are the anchors for the iron or steel rods that run all the way through the building and hold it together, keep it from falling apart. I mean, if you built a building in 1750 out of brick, you probably weren't thinking too much about whether it was going to lean over the next 300 years and eventually fall over. Well, so, luckily, somebody did think of that at some point, and they braced the building so it would stay up. <clears throat> now think about what those stars and those iron rods are that hold the house of Jesus together, that hold our own faith individually together. Surely they are the love of God that has been put into our hearts, the impulse to bring justice into the world, the impulse to bring mercy into the world, to somehow heal everything that is wrong with the world. I was asked recently how we in the church deal with conflict. And I, my honest answer would have been not particularly well. <laughs> but what I said was, it seems like it works best whenever we can come back to recognizing what our mission is, what we were put here for. There will always be disagreement once we get past that point. But we have to recognize where those supports are that hold up the house. Be sure that we are keeping track of them and doing periodic maintenance on them. Not simply in the house of Jesus that is this place, but in the house of the Holy Spirit that is each one of us. Have you done periodic maintenance on your soul lately? So Jesus manages to dispense with those who had come with a theological argument he can move on to those who have come with something that actually is probably a little more difficult. His own family coming to say, we, we've heard you, you, you've gone off the rails. Maybe he's not possessed by a demon. Maybe he's just gotten too high an opinion of himself. Maybe he's forgotten who he is. Maybe he's forgotten what he's supposed to be doing, what his responsibilities are in the world. That sounds like a tougher argument to refute, doesn't it? Note also that they come and stand outside. They also don't go in to the house. They are calling Jesus to leave the house of faith, calling him to leave the house where the home has been built for the movement of the Spirit. And Jesus resists, this time in a way that probably would cut us to the heart more than being told that, that we, we don't understand what the devil is about, but rather family isn't what we think it is either. Somehow all those who are sent to us by God become a bigger family, become important to us in a way that builds on where it is we began perhaps, but that doesn't limit us to where we began. His family are expecting to get back Jesus, the son of Joseph the carpenter, who helps his father at work during the day, who takes care of his mother, who has other responsibilities in his village. Jesus has become someone else. He has recognized the broad space into which God has brought followers to be around him. This new movement that is beginning, this new family that has been created, these, these ties that have been made and will continue and will endure because they are the home that is inside the house. Once he has begun that, there's no turning back. It's one of those old gospel hymns, when you put your hand to the gospel plow, there are those who know the words better than I will, so I will quote nothing more than the first line because I'll begin to get it wrong quickly. Those old gospel hymn writers had a point. Once you begin... There is no going back. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once the new home begins to take shape, we can only continue it. So, dear friends, that is our work. That's where we find ourselves today. We who are the dwelling places of the Holy Spirit, each of us individually and all of us together. It is our job to cultivate that home that grows in us, to recognize where it is that God would lead us to go there joyfully. Amen.